This is a program that's going to be the third Thursday of every month, starting tonight, April 20th, and running through uh, third Thursday of September. It's going to be local, specifically Scotts Valley and inland parts of Santa Cruz County, concerning uh, environmental uh, science, uh, natural science, environmental science. And Julianne Rhodes is been the person who put this whole program together. She found the speakers, including our wonderful fly fisherman tonight. And I'm going to turn this over to Julianne. There are flyers over on the table, rack cards about the whole series you can get as you go and look at Tom's fishing gear. And Thank now Julianne. Thank you very much. I, um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Jo, who uh, knows Tom better than me, so she's going to do the honors. And, and Julianne's got a bit of a cold. <laughs> yeah, so. it'll be better that way. Um, so I am so excited that Tom is here. When he heard that we were helping the city of Scotts Valley with their Clean Creeks campaign, um, he got really into it, and right away he said he wanted to help out. He said, I don't know how, but just keep me in mind. And then, lo and behold, um, Julianne started organizing the speaker series with the libraries. And um, it was just a perfect fit. And I love that he's kicking it off, because I know it's going to be the best one. Um, so <laughs> no pressure, Tom, no pressure. So Tom is the past president, conservation chair, and programs chair for the Santa Cruz Fly Fishermen. He spent 12 years working to promote sustainable fisheries management. Has a lot of stories from that time about what our creeks used to look like and how much fish there used to be in our creeks. Um, that gives me pause, actually. I think about the stories of how much fish were in our creeks when I was a child, and then I think about my own children and what they might not have when they grow up, so that gives me pause. Um, Tom works tirelessly on the update of fishing regulations for the protection of salmon and steelhead throughout California, a change that hadn't occurred in more than 30 years. He's currently the director of business development at UCF Refining. Um, he works tirelessly to recycle so you, you, I see him all over town when he's recycling electronics for a lot of the local businesses and over the hill as well. Um, he's lectured at Yale School of Forestry, Colorado School of Mines, other university schools and industry related areas specifically for the preservation of the environment. And he acted as a U.S. industry expert with the IEC NEMA. <laughs> and, What's that? <laughs> International Electrotechnical Commission. Okay, yeah. great. They, 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 they create ISO standards or NEMA or UL standards. Yeah. Great, okay. And I he, just, just told him to say that word, don't say that word. And he's also been written for periodicals on conservation and fly fishing. And so we're lucky to have him here today. And you've lived in Boulder Creek now for how long? Ben Loman. Ben Loman. 20 Lohman. years now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. 34 years here. Great. Yeah. Well, 1982. welcome. 1982. Thank you. We're excited you. to hear your talk. And my first foray into Santa Cruz was in 1982, right when the storms hit in October. Well, Joe, I usually am staring at Joe because she's riding a mountain bike in front of me with her daughter who's lightning fast and she was like 12. Back then. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that, yeah, so she already told the story. But thank you so much for coming and being here. I see some of my old friends and brother. Um, really glad to be here. I'm really glad to be doing this again because I have not done this in a long time. When Joe mentioned about what I did for the Fly Fishing Club or what I did in Santa Cruz County, I did that all before there was such a thing as the internet or a cell phone. And when I undertook this project, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I spent hours and hours and hours looking for things. And so uh, it was, it's so great to be able to use the internet and to, to do the research and find some great photographs and the video that we had. I mean, you would never be able to do that before. We were writing letters and sending fax machines. We had this clunky email system and we would go to the fishery advisory committee meetings and then we'd jump in a car and drive to Bridgeport or drive down south to go to the Fish and Game Commission meetings. And um, it was tireless work because it was a lot of hours and a lot of sending stuff everywhere. So this is electronic industry, I guess it's kind of nice because we get to do this now. But I know most of you didn't bring your sleeping bags. 
So we have a lot of ground to cover and I'm going to try and cover that ground quickly and we'll come back to things. And uh, I, I have a tendency to talk a lot, so uh, we should go. Well, this is all about fly fishing, the San Lorenzo River, and the history of fly fishing and the conservation that we want to see take place within the watershed. Uh, it's 29, 23 miles long. By the way, I did a lot of research. I collected a lot of numbers. A lot of people provided me with some data that was extraordinary. I mean, Don Alley sent me three books. They were about 177 pages long. And Kristen sent me some great stuff to use. I have a lot of data, so if I do get some numbers wrong, don't hesitate to correct me. But we have 20, 29 miles of the San Lorenzo River, you know, way up in uh, Castle Craig's Park, but about 14 fishable miles. That was easy because I just Googled where Loman Street Bridge is and then where the mouth of the river is and it said it was 14 miles. And I said, okay, that's about right. Um, but uh, this is what the river looks like uh, certain times of the year. This was uh, our winter in, the, this was the major flood event day. I went down to the mouth of the river. That's the mouth of the river crashing in to the ocean. And then the same picture, just a little to the right. And the reason I have that red circle there is because there's two sea lions sitting there. Just Bob in there, you can't really see them. There's one right here, and then there's one right here. And they're just bobbing their head, swimming back and forth in that little tiny channel that the <coughs> steelhead and coho salmon are, are trying to get into. So those fish, not only do they have the trouble out in the ocean, but they are right away, as soon as they're trying to get back, they're running into uh, the, the, the problems of the river. Uh, a few days later, I went down to the river. There was a sea lion over here, and he was moving about, trying to get around this corner to come up the side. Desperate, and had muddy, chalky water. I couldn't believe it. But there was a big sea lion. Uh, yeah, yeah, anyhow, that's what they do. Uh, 40,000 fish, maybe 500, maybe 1,000 fish today. Uh, 40,000 fish was a long time ago. Uh, 10,000 CFS, maybe at a really good flood stage when the kayakers like to go down the river and then about six CFS, heat of the summer, when we're all using all the water. Uh, not really good for the fish. Uh, this was River Street uh, at the flood event stage, which was beautiful to be down there and see that. It was just cleaning out the river. It was, it was really awesome to see. Now, had the levee not been there, the whole downtown area would have been flooded. But it created a beautiful channel here. Greg Pepping and I, illegally, we walked down here. But I was kind of dressed like this. And he was dressed nice. So we obviously weren't transient drug addicts. So we, the people who drive along the levee were pretty good about letting us stay down there. But there's some beautiful little channels here that the fish like to move through. I call it the racetrack because they're not really hanging out there. They're moving. When the fish come in, they're, they're, they're not doing much in here. They're getting up into paradise and then up into Rincon, places like that. But it was really awesome to see the river get cleaned out pretty good uh, this year. Uh, the gorge, I don't know how many of you get to go up in the San Lorenzo River and have actually walked along the San Lorenzo, gotten into the gorge down at Rincon and stuff. It's just really beautiful. And uh, this is uh, a, a very placid little flow here, but this is when the kayakers like to go. This is about 10,000 CFS right here. This might be maybe 18 or 19, I'm not sure. Uh, we know the Paradise Bridge uh, right here. This is a really beautiful place to, to be. All, all this is really good fishable water. I caught some really nice young steelhead in there drifting a comet, which is a, I, I brought a whole bunch of show and tell stuff. We, we'll, we'll see that a little bit later. Super dangerous. Uh, if it's like this and you tell your wife you're going steelhead fishing, Tom, <laughs> like this, don't go down there because you, you can lose your life. But these guys, I see them when I'm fishing, they put in at Felton Henry Cowell Bridge and then they, you know, make their way down. This is a bad one, but, um, you know, this is the Garden of Eden in the summer. This is a problem too now because we're getting a lot of, you know, pollution by, you know, people just leaving stuff down there. But you can't blame them. It's really nice, so they want to hang out there and be a part of the river. I included this, all this artwork because I kept, every time I Googled a picture on Steelhead, I was coming up with these, this beautiful artwork. So fish are beautiful in nature, but they're also beautiful in paint. Uh, this is one of my favorite fishing spots. 
I, I hooked the largest fish I ever caught uh, in this place. It was probably, I don't know how big it was, maybe 12 pounds. But this is the Felton Bridge right here. I'm standing on top of the bridge. Uh, you can see the railing. And uh, so this stick got shoved up in there, and that's it here. So I'm down fishing. I'm actually standing on the bridge. You can see my fly line here. So I'm drifting on a fly through the water down below. But the river changes pretty dramatically. It was awesome to see all that. It got cleaned out really nice. I actually went over there today. I went to a few places today looking for fish. Uh, I didn't find any. But they're there, I'm sure of it. And they really have a nice chance now to get started all over again. See, it's not this year that's really going to bring the fish in. I went to uh, Bean Creek, and Bean Creek looks beautiful right now. There's not, there hasn't been water in Bean Creek in probably five years. It just looks really beautiful right now. I was traipsing around down there, probably wondering what the heck I was doing, but uh, no fish. I couldn't see anything. Now, you know, if they can hear me, I can get pretty stealthy because the fish can see you a lot sooner than then you can see them. So I know how to be pretty stealthy, but couldn't find anything. I don't think there are going to be any fish in Bear Creek right now, or Bean Creek right now. But we need, if we protect the waterway now, then there might be some in the years to come, and in just a few short years. The library will be uh, this is the Felton Diversion Amp. This is the other side of the bridge. You can fish up to this bridge, uh, or up to the dam, about 200 feet. It's a really beautiful run in here. Uh, I'll show you a picture of a little guy that wants to be a steelhead, and I, I caught him like right in here, and just below the the rubber dam. Um, I have some old newspapers, and that article was in one of them, and it's by my good friend. He's retired. Uh, he's deceased now, but Jim Lazzarotti, who was instrumental in helping me figure out all of this stuff that he writes about, and was uh, very active in. Uh, at the time when we were fishing for steelhead and trying to save the salmon and steel, steelhead in the San Lorenzo. Jim would call me up and uh, he always called me kid. A lot of the guys in the fly fishing club called me kid because I was much younger then. And what little I had wasn't great. <laughs> but um, he would say, hey kid, he had this, it's like six five, one lung, born and raised here pretty much. Fished the river forever. Uh, and an uh, expert surf perch fisherman. But he would come, hey kid, I saw some fish rolling down at the old buckeye hole. Of course, there's no buckeye tree in there anymore, but he called it the old buckeye hole. And he would say, you want to come down and fish with me? And he would take me out into the water and teach me how to fish. And, you know, six foot five and I'm five, six. And he'd get out further and, and he'd say, come on, kid. And I'm like, I can't. I'm, I can't. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to go, I'm going to be wet. You know? So uh, he, he was a great guy. But this is the Felton Diversion Dam. It's a very beautiful stretch of water. There's a nice hole right here. Larry Montanez and this other guy, Callie, always fish right in here. There's always fish sitting right underneath here because there's a nice big ledge they can hang out in. And um, very shallow in here. So you can oftentimes stand right in here and drift and fly right through there. And when people see me fly fishing there, uh, Tom probably gets the same remarks, maybe Dan, they go, are you nuts? Why? You're not going to catch any fish with a fly rod. We saw that in the video, right? This is the Loman Street Bridge. I'd actually never been there. So I went there. And because I know that you can fish up to this bridge, and, but you can't fish beyond it. And then right on the other side of it is this old dam structure. Uh, Kristen has some great photos of it in her presentation. But uh, right, right on the other side of this. So you can't fish above the dam. So that's the 14 mile mark. That area is really yucky. You don't want to fish that. But this is nice you know, in, a, in a really nice flow region. Remember, we are here to talk about fishing and fly fishing for sure. So I'll do that a lot. Oh, so these are our prizes. Uh, coho salmon, some people call them silvers, or silver salmon, or silver. And basically you're looking for a, a fish that is going to have a little bit of black in their mouth. The Chinook, their mouth is like all black. But easy to tell if you're a fisherman, um, the difference between coho and uh, steelhead. But maybe not so much if you're not a fisherman. At some point or another, this color changes gradually as they come out of the 
salt water. When they're in the salt water, it's very, very chrome. They're very, very bright fish. Sometimes they have like what they call sea lice on their tail. And so people go, oh, this is a beautiful fish because he's fresh out of the ocean. You know, they're like, wow, this is like he just got in here yesterday. And then when they get colored like this, they're on their way out, usually spawn. Uh, male, big kite type jaws, but the females much less so. Um, this is a, a I don't think it's great, but I use this photo because the coho will oftentimes have a little bit of speckle on their back as they start to change, especially the females. So their back would be more green than, um, and then here's, here's some better pictures. You know, these are nice. Um, I, I, I had a trip of a lifetime in Alaska in 2009, and I was catching coho all morning. We literally went in the, in the water at seven in the morning, and they said, you need to fish right now. Because if you don't fish right now, there aren't gonna be any fish in the river in pretty soon. And I said, what do you mean pretty soon? They go, yeah, like one o'clock, there's no more fishing. And so I was catching fish and I was letting them all go. I was using my fly rod, it was the most fun I'd ever had. And then the guys were giving me a hard time. Hoagie, we have a three fish limit, you need three fish. So I, had, I kept this one, he was a male, so I, I kept him. Uh, and uh, that was the only picture that I, had his hand. But that's uh, pretty typical coho. Nice big fish in Alaska and some of the upper street, upper stretches. These guys were about eight pounds. Sometimes we've caught some that were a little bit bigger. There are lots of other things in the San Lorenzo River. Uh, I used the mountain biker because uh, <laughs> you yeah. see these salamanders there. They're monster salamanders, garter snakes, red-legged frogs with three, three sticklebacks, something or other. That, um, Three spine. The three spine, thank you. The sculpin, the, that's a goby. That's the uh, you know, western ponter. And the lamprey, I, I've never seen any. The sucker, I thought it, uh, I thought it was a, a steelhead when I was at the Felton Bridge. I was all excited because I saw a fish like that guy did in the video. And then I realized, nah, it was, it was too, too lackadaisical, it wasn't really scared. It was kind of swimming, I knew it was a, a sucker, which is fine, because they're in the river for all the right reasons. And then there's this guy, or gal. I think, you know, instead of doing Finding Nemo, we should do Finding, we should name the steelhead. Don't, I think we could do a great Disney movie on steelhead. But then look how cute he is. He's just like, I mean, how, how can you resist that? And then they get like this. What I loved about this picture, it says rainbow trout, Oncorhynchus micus, uh, which just means old Native American, I think. It means just, it goes to the ocean. But the steelhead are awesome because they're unlike a coho salmon or the Chinook salmon or any other salmon that go up river and die. These guys go up river, have fun, have family go back. Then they go back again the next year. Very unusual species of trout. And they get really big. So um, what I liked about it is it says the Great Lakes. I grew up in Ohio in the Cleveland area. And on the Chagrin River, every year my friend, every, my best friend Michael Dillman and I, my dad would take us down to the river and we would fish for steelhead. But we were snagging for them. We would literally take a big treble hook and wrap it with lead and just chuck it and then rip it through the water and try and hit one. Because there were so many fish in the river. They just, like, you could keep five fish a day. And a lot of guys would go back and they'd catch five fish, they'd go back in the afternoon and catch five more. Because there were so many fish. So I, I just thought it was funny that they had the Great Lakes. And if you think about the ice age and melting and how everything, it, it makes sense. Um, so these, these are fish from the San Lorenzo. Uh, Ernie Kinsley, used to be Ernie's Casting Pond. Uh, love the guy. I mean, I used to hang out in the shop regularly. This actually might be, I haven't had a chance to ask him, but it could, it could possibly be Soquel Creek, because that was Ernie's favorite place to fish. Uh, Mike Baxter, he's part of the Monterey Bay Salmon Trout Project, but some, it said it was his son, but I don't think that's his son. Uh, that's a beautiful fish down in the gorge or Paradise Park area. Barry Burr, uh, a, a great advocate for salmon and fisheries, and uh, he's got more than one or two of those pictures. 
uh, like that. And this is just a young fish that really would be going out. But see how pretty and bright and silvery. And this is my, I want to be a steelhead someday. But look at that fly. That fly's like this big. It's over there somewhere. And that guy hit that fly from flying out of the water right at the Felton Bridge here. You can see the Felton Bridge up in the corner, so the dam is behind me. And uh, he just nailed that thing. Now the beauty of that fly being so big and having to use a barbless lure, I just took the hook and I turned it upside down and he fell off and went right back in the water. I never even touched it, which is the right thing to do and we, we should all do more of that. We really take care of the fish. I'll show some video clips if we can get them to work this right. Um, this is important because if you do start to fish for, for steelhead or salmon, uh, fill that little paper that's in there. They're, they're, this is weird, this is a felt. I opened this up and there were three razors in there, like shaving razors. <laughs> but there's a pencil and a piece of paper and you complete it and it says, you know, did you catch any fish? No. How, was your experience good? Yeah, I had a nice day. You know, how big was the fish? How many fish did you catch? A couple other things. Uh, I didn't take a picture of one of those, but um, it's important. I, I will say that I was fishing down there, and I said, be truthful. It's okay to say it was a little fish. You know, fishermen, we got this thing. That by the end of the story, that steel had a cut will be 15 pounds by the end of the But um, I, I ran into a guy, and he said, he said, write down that you caught like some big hatchery fish or something, because we, we want to make sure that we keep propagating the, the, the hatcheries. And I just thought, ah, I'm just going to write one of these. Caught. So, beautiful place to fish. When the water starts to get really nice and green like this, you can see a couple feet into the water. It's just a beautiful place to be. I mean, this was a Wednesday morning. Where do you think I was supposed to be? <laughs> <laughs> I met the guy who runs the meat market, the meat counter at Shopper's Corner. His name's Tony. It's a great guy. I mean, you meet people. They become family on the river. It's really a fun thing to do. And um, I said, I gotta go. He goes, you, you can't go. He goes, I go, no, I gotta go to work. He goes, no, you can't go. You can't go to work. I mean, really, you're gonna go to work? And I said, no, I'm not gonna go to work now. Thank you very much, son. That's all I needed. Everybody's happy. Everybody. I mean, you catch a fish like that, even the little guy. I was very happy. I worked all morning to catch that little guy. Um, and also, I did this because there are lots of people who have dogs that like to fish. And, um, no, I mean, you know, you bundle up, you bring your girlfriend, your wife. I mean, when I met Mona, all my friends were jealous because they said, you have a, your wife likes to fish? That's awesome! Jim, uh, Jim was a great guy. And um, my wife likes to go to the, um, the Abbott's Thrift. She went to the Abbott's Thrift one day, bought a whole bunch of newspapers for like $1.29. She came up with the old newspaper and they go, hmm, what are we gonna, there it is, right on the front page. Jim Lazzarotti, this, this paper is 1959. He's already working on the San Lorenzo watershed clearing. So this 1959, after the flood of 55, when the river was a big mess and there were trees down everywhere, the fish were being damaged. And uh, I said, oh, amazing. There's a whole stack of them over there. And almost every paper is about the end of the fish, the rivers getting destroyed. The, the timber harvests are terrible. They're building road. I mean, it's everything. And Jim Lazzarotti's in the middle of all of it. I met Jim probably 1993, I think. And I, he, he never ever said any of this stuff. He never puffed up his chest and said, I do this, I do that. He was just a humble, quiet guy who loved to fish. And he would write, and he would go to the meetings, and he would stand up at 6'5", and he had, he had a presence that you just could not ignore him. And I had no idea, even after he died, I had no idea that he had, had done all this work. Um, yeah, so I, I, I've been trying to find old photos of all of San Lorenzo fly fishermen who fly fished the San Lorenzo River. And this is the only one I could get from Tim Loomis, who was also a past president, with a big cromer that uh, 
that Jim got. got and, and look, he said, mm, okay. You know, he probably caught a million of those fish in his lifetime in Santa Cruz. But he was always aware. There were a whole, whole bunch of guys that were always aware of what was going on in the river. These are more of the articles. Here. Clearing on Zianni Creek, 1959, death for the fish next. I mean, there's a whole pile of them over there if you want to. Um, I think I'm going to skip this video clip. Is to Because we're on a roll. Uh, Jim Dick Wainer was another guy. I met him when I first got started. I was totally a young kid, ignorant. I was 30. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, we're going to change things, doggone it. We're going to, you know, we're going to, and he was like, easy kid, you know. Um, Manny Gutierrez, I love the guy. He always, to this day, I, I try to fish with a big Waller Waker or a Steelhead B because he says, you've got to get one on top. You've got to get one on top someday. And so I do that because I love that guy. Rick Von Karnak, some of his flies are there. He was killed in a boating accident. Rogue Wave flipped him and, and John Fong over in the, out in the bay. Both died, drowned. Uh, Bob Simon, met Bob Simon as I was like running. I was, I was booking it down Rincon. I mean, it's early. I'm getting down there. I'm, I'm catching a half of fish a day. And um, I, I went flying by him. And he goes, where are you going? What's your hurry? Where are you going? You know? And I, I said, uh, I got to get down to the river. The fish is, they're not going anywhere. They might not even be there. And he was so good. And he, and he said, you know, I, I, I do that. I pay people this favor now. He said, now you should probably take that net back to the car. You're not supposed to have a net. I had this little tiny trout net. He said, you're going under the catch steelhead, aren't you? It's not going to fit in that net. And if you catch something that's going to fit in that net, you're not going to really want that. You've got to take the net back to the car. So I repay that to everybody I see, I see now today on the river, and they have a little net. I go, you know what? You're probably a yeah, can't. No. And I say the same thing Bob did. It totally makes sense. Ed Marcellac, I think in one of those pictures I have an ad advertisement, I'm pretty sure that's him standing in his pram in the lagoon because he, um, that's how he loved to fish the lagoon, in, in his pram. Uh, Dave Allen, who's my neighbor, lives right across the street from me. I live at Love Creek where the, where the fish ladder is and, the, and the, the falls. I did see a really nice fish on Love Creek the other day when you came up and you were looking for me. Uh, and Al Smith was another great guy. Um, uh, most all of them are gone. Uh, Ed's still up in Sacramento. Ernie is hunting elk somewhere. Uh, but they all watched the river and they, they had a voice. Jim would be the first guy to go down in the county and say, something's not right. You guys are pulling too much water out of the river because there's not enough water in the river for the fish. He'd be the first guy to get down the county or the city and say something. And they're all fishermen. That's all they did. Oh, yeah. Okay, you have to watch them. Okay, so we're talking about fishing and fly fishing in general. Now, fishing the San Lorenzo, this video clip is very bad. I, I, I press it. Watch what he's doing. He's basically flipping. And that's how you do a lot of the work with a fly rod on the San Lorenzo. Now, he's using what's called a strike indicator. Um, it's a fancy word that fly fishermen use for bobber. And so we, we like to call them the strike indicators. And he obviously can see a fish there. And so he's using probably what's an egg pattern. Because usually if you're using a strike indicator, you're using some, something like a little egg pattern. But he, we say fish of a thousand casts. So he probably casts 70 times in here. Now he's not really casting, he's doing this flipping thing. But that's what you do on the San Lorenzo. You're not going out there doing this really nice shadow casting like you see on the river runs through it. Maybe in the lagoon. Um, so only a couple minutes and he gets a pretty good grab there. I'm, I'm going to go right through this. Because it's only a couple minutes, but you're bored already. Right? I mean, we're, we're fishing for hours and hours to do this. So I know you're bored already, so I'm going right to the good stuff. So he finally gets down there. Oh, oh I think one more. <laughs> deep, like two more casts, yeah, that's what he... And his friend... <sighs> so I said wait for it. 
Wait for it. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so this is great. Little tiny fish, just like mine. His friend is so freaked out, he's, he's dropped a hammer. <laughs> so he's like, oh, crap. But a little tiny fish. And, you know, you will see these fish in the room. Um, all right, come on, hurry. Oh. Oh. Little, yeah, little tiny fish. <laughs> so these do exist in the San Lorenzo. I mean, I, I'm surprised that people don't know this. Now, he loses it, and he just goes right back to fishing. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's just great. That's what we do. I mean, okay, that was that was one for the one for this deal. And that's you know, okay. I didn't have to. I didn't have to wear the fish out. But the kind of casting you're doing with a rod like this of a fly rod on the San Lorenzo is you're really the way called chuck and duck or the San Lorenzo swing. Um, many guys will take a fly rod and they'll just load their fly rod reel with monofilament and just like do a swing and they call it the San Lorenzo swing because they're just trying to get the, the their weighted, um, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> and so this one I, I grabbed because the guy has a dog and I have a dog and she likes to eat the fish. So don't bring your dog because it does make things a little more difficult. Now, he's also doing the same thing. He's got a strike indicator, so I'm guessing he's fishing with an egg pattern. And these are likely up in Oregon. Oh, this is Oregon's Suisla River. Um, but what I, if you haven't fished for steelhead before, and you're like, okay, what's the big deal? Why? You know, um, but you want to fish for steelhead. You want to give it a try. You want that bend in your rod. And then, okay, you catch a fish, now what do you do? Well, don't, bring the, don't get the fish out of the water. Don't bring your dog. Yeah. <laughs> and don't get the fish out of the water. I mean, you just reach down, grab his tail. Yeah, he's tired, she's tired. She's still got a lot of work to do, spawning yet, and then she's gotta go back to the ocean, deal with a bunch of dams and wood and sea lions. But he's just hanging on, unbuttoning the fish, trying not to type. Touch it, and then what did what did the um, dean call the little picture thing? When you do the picture, it's like the it's like the self-aggrandizing three second. You pull the fish out, take the picture, put the fish back in the water. Don't don't grab the fish, up, and then you know try and take a picture with the fish. So he does pretty good, and that's really why I wanted to use this video to demonstrate you know taking good care of the fish. You know, I don't even know why we do this, but it's for the same reason why people like to knit and, <laughs> and things like that. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, uh, this one is, this This is pretty typical, it's kind of San Lorenzo style, downstream swing. And then the line starts to belly, he's, he's fishing his tail out in a pool. We have lots of language and lingo and stuff. And then, yeah, and then you get some nice small fish here. And this video is actually about 20 minutes long, but he's condensed it down to, well, it may be 10 minutes, but he's condensed it down to two minutes and 13 seconds. Um, and, but that's pretty typical of how big some of the spots might be on the San Lorenzo. Very nice color in the water. See, that's nice and turquoise and dark green. And um, the, the, the flow is about right in some of the winter places, especially down in the gorge where the big rock hole is or the Rincon hole is. Or, um, and, and you'll learn these names pretty quickly. Um, but pretty much how the San Lorenzo would look. I don't have any videos on the San Lorenzo. So I'm gonna have to fix that, right? Next year. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's really what I wanted to encourage you uh, with this portion is this how the San Lorenzo looks if you're gonna fish with a fly it's very hard but it's very fun it's very rewarding it's very peaceful and so that's kind of how it would look in, in places now if you're left-handed like me it, it's just you're totally messed up right now because I showed you all these videos that are right-handed <laughs> um, no levy no levy uh, this is what it was like this could be at Marcelac down here we, we don't know but in, in this, this is still there. Uh, it's, all, it's overgrown a lot, and Branch Forty Creek comes by. But the bait guys would be on this side. It'll all be down here, all the bait guys, and the fly fishermen on the other side. And then, of course, all the guys in the prams in the middle. And this picture was 1941, I think, so before the 55 flood, which pretty much ruined everything. Um, 
This is what they called the Buckeye Hole. You can see the Buckeye Tree is still there. Uh, it's not there anymore. This is where Jim Lazarotti took me fishing. And I, like I said, I went out here. And he's like, come on, kid. <laughs> and I was just like, I can't, Jim. Um, Isn't that the Water Street Bridge? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. I, I, I don't, yeah, thank you. Yeah. But um, very atypical. I mean, it, it was a festival. People couldn't wait to go for the steelhead opener to come out. And um, I, I have some, I can't find them because in the 90s I did all this research and I, I went and grabbed everything off of microfish. Somebody donated all these pictures to me and I can't find them. We moved, rebuilt the house, I had kids, they're now 18 and 20 years old. And uh, I, I, I'm heartbroken because I can't find them. They're probably in an attic somewhere. But I have these articles that, you know, the San Lorenzo River, in fact, you find, you'll find this on the internet. It'll say it was the most famous fishery in North, Northern California. Most famous. What? San Lorenzo? Seriously? 300 bucks a day per person to the economy. Because guys love to spend money on fishing gear. They take your wife to the hotel. You're having dinner at night. 300 bucks a day. This was like in the 70s. That's a lot of money. But you know, most fishermen, we well, have a lot of money for fishing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the most famous. Yeah, it was, it was beautiful. I have the article that was written in I, uh, Sunset Magazine or something like that. I just can't find it. I really wanted that article. This is great. This is on the other side. There's no levee, but there's this little wall here. And these kids are fishing. It's obviously in the summertime. Jim Lazarotti, I think, used to fish Sine Creek, and it was, the limit was 25 fish a day in the summer. <laughs> Trout. He would go down there for breakfast in the morning, catch fish, could bring home, make them for breakfast in Zion. I don't even, I don't even, yeah. It's pretty sad. See, I think this is Ed Marcelac. Oh, or one of these two. You know, Ed, he had that, he had that like permanent fishing thing. I went to the Santa Cruz Public Library and I, I said I'd like some old articles and this guy took me over to the microfish machine. And I sat there at the microfish, spinning microfish for hours. I went all the way back to 1908. And I knew there was November, you know, there, there was a time when the fishing started in December. It was December 1st. And then sometime in, in later in years it went to like November 16th so that we could fish for Thanksgiving. It was my most favorite thing to do Thanksgiving morning, was to go down to the gorge and fish on Thanksgiving morning. I loved it. And um, then they changed it to December 1st in 1998, I think. And that was part of the work that I did, but um, I don't know why they changed it to December. Uh, it doesn't really, fish, fish don't care. But it was every, every, it was a festival. I mean, every year, going back to 1908, every opener, was, uh, there was always an article, always pictures, there was always follow-up a couple days later, because it's what we did here. And we, we need to still, this is the gorge, you know, the lagoon, lagoon. Um, you know, planting was a long time ago. I think this article here is 1937. I, um, yeah, I have it. I was at the microfish. I was sitting there for a long time. This gal walks up to me. She goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking up old articles on the newspaper. She goes, well, we got, got it all on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there like two hours. <laughs> and I said, seriously? She goes, yeah, you can just do a search. And she, so she's, and then I, oh my gosh, that, I, was, I, was, I was in hog heaven. Uh, tackle. Uh, if you fish winter steelhead and it's rainy, you're up in Washington and you're in Oregon and it's just raining every day, you spend a lot of time tying flies. Mm -hmm. And it's a fun thing to do. Mona knows this. I sit in the house at, late at night, maybe have a beer or two, and uh, I, I like to make flies. And, uh, and the steelhead, if you remember, and salmon, they're not in here to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They're like when I was preparing for this thing, I didn't sleep. I, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. All I was thinking about was spawning. And, and so that's all the thing. No, I was always thinking about doing this presentation. But, but um, seriously, that, that's what they're, so you're kind of pissing them off is what you're doing. You're putting this thing in front of them. Now if you, you swing a salmon egg or a, like an egg sucking leech, 
uh, they're gonna probably think it's a salmon egg, so I'll a little snack, give me some protein to get up the river. But, um, you know, you can just never have too much tackle. Uh, one of my friends in Wyoming, uh, she said to me one day, she said, uh, oh, I know about those California steelhead. I heard that California steelhead like Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I love this woman, and uh, she, so I said, okay. So I, I created this pattern. I made it myself, and I called it the Matuka Cheetos. <laughs> now, Matuka is a style of fly when you tie the wing on the top, or, and in this case, it's a piece of rabbit strip, and then um, got big barbell eyes because we want this to go down fast. I got some flashaboo here, and then this is all what they call saddle hackle from a hen. And uh, you lay the rabbit fur on top and then you tease it up like a mohawk, <laughs> and then you wrap it, and uh, you wrap it one way with the hackle, and then you wrap it the other way with the wire, and it's fun. I fished that fly for six hours. Six hours. And I didn't catch it. <laughs> so, uh, and it was really a bummer. The, I caught fish on this, though, which is great. I mean, I love catching fish on a, on a fly. And they all have great names, like Brad's Brat. This is the Silver Hilton, the Comet, for obvious reasons. Um, the Skycomish Sunrise, the Purple Peril. Uh, I, green Butt Skunk. <laughs> Sometimes people make a Red Butt Skunk, which is really stinky. Um, and the, you know, and the lingo. I mean, so red butt skunk, green butt skunk. So we tried to get this one to go. I'm I'm gonna. So far it's going. Okay, that's good. And uh, I I want you to. Oh, wow. A lot of different things we talk Steel about. Steelheading's hard. Fish of a thousand casts, you know. Got a spay rod here. Thirteen foot seven. Eight weight, four pieces. Lifetime warranty. House of visibility. About a foot. That's all you need. All you need is about a foot. You got your backing, your running line, your shooting head, your sink tip, your leader, then your fly. That's how it goes. You see if your arms hurt, you're doing it wrong. I'm always doing it wrong. I can do a snake roll. Fish of a thousand casts, though. More like 10,000, huh? Hey, you gotta get it down. Mend it, get it down. <coughs> this actually happened. Fly fishing only. You chucking a stack it or standy? Long bellied spade. Oh. You fish the riffle? Oh, look at that bucket. Four piece, not a two piece. Whoopsies. Nothing like a tight line grab, huh? The tug is the drug. Hey, you think I need a weighted fly? Yeah. I could be a guy, but I don't want to mix passion with work. How much sink tip should I use? Five feet of T14 or 10 feet? I'm just going to use an intermediate sink tip, I think. Maybe I'll throw in a floating line, see if I can get one on the dry. <coughs> I fly fish only. Pretty long and clear today. Can you parry poke? Hey, I got a tube fly on. Snap tape? Squamish poacher? Egg sucking leech? Mostly bomber? There's waterborne casts and there's airborne casts. I think I'm going to skate it dry. Blood fishing's like poetry. They say you gotta read the water. What language do you think is written in? <laughs> Nothing like firing a laser, cross a river into a riffle, drift through a seam, swing your fly, tight line grab, tug its drunk, you know? Oh, fish of a thousand casts. <laughs> you will encounter that. Uh, maybe not in the San Lorenzo. It's good. Uh, so what happened? You know, I met Kathy Powers in 1992. She was the conservation chair at the San Lorenzo, or San Lorenzo, Santa Cruz Fly Fisherman. Used to be the San Lorenzo Steelheaders. Long time ago. <coughs> but you know, uh, we just, we kind of came here. We found out how beautiful it was. We hung out. We found out there was a lot of wood. We could make houses. and. So we kind of dammed stuff up. This Newell Creek right here, it's full of wood. Um, it's all dammed up, which was pretty common because they would dam up the river so they could float logs down. I mean, does anybody know about the San, uh, San Lorenzo flume? It like, went like practically the whole length of the river. And, and they used to have, like, have rides that you could go on, these little Sunday rides with your parasol, on this flume of water that they would get logs down. I think a few people got hurt, so they stopped doing that. 
Um, this is out at San Vicente. I mean, just stripped, clear cut. You know, uh, we, we pretty much did that everywhere, uh, and it's pretty easy to see. Like, if you, we we do a lot of mountain bike riding, and if you ride in UCSC or many places, you see the redwoods aren't very big. You know, and then you'll see a huge one, a couple huge ones, and that's because the old, some of the old growth trees got left. But a lot of the smaller trees you see aren't even 100 years old. So we pretty much cleared out everything for quite a while. And, that, and Kathy Powers, she's been great. She said, well, that's kind of how it started. And then it got cleaned up. And everybody went to war. And in, in, in the 40, 45, everybody came back from the war. And the water was really good. In fact, most of the research I do all up and down the, the California, Oregon coastline, People talk about the 40s and the 50s, how good it was in the 40s and 50s. In fact, the article that I have from the from 1941 talks about you know 40,000 fish in the river, 25,000 fish in the San Lorenzo River, and today there's maybe 500 or 1,000. Um, so I figured that while everybody came back from war and while everybody was away at war, the river was the rivers were recovering. There was nothing going on. People were too busy doing other stuff. The logging was all done, the forests were regrowing, it was being managed, probably guys like Jim Lazzarotti were already saying, hey, don't cut those trees down like that. Um, we did some mining you know, for sand and gravel, that's still going on, that is a problem, but you know, people own that land, you're allowed to do it, we just have to figure out how to manage it. Um, I live along Zianti, and I've seen Zianti Creek for 20 years, and it's orange. It will literally be orange when every other river is clear. And it's because there was an accident at the mine up there, in the sand mine. Yeah, so you have to call and say, hey, what's going on? I think something's not right. We should, can, can we fix this? Can we do better? I, you know, when I was 30, I was super antagonistic. I, people didn't like me. Guys were saying, literally, guys said to me, if you weren't a fisherman, you'd have concrete boots on and you'd be in the river. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to be that way anymore. But I do want to figure out what we can do. To, so we can fish. Ah. <laughs> I want to go backwards. There's a, on the bottom. There's, there's a little arrow, arrow on the, the pointing bottom. to the left on the bottom. On the, the very ball. bottom, where it popped up. Click, click first. Click. Yeah. There, there you go. God, I totally messed it up. <laughs> You're doing good too, actually. I'm like. If you guys aren't asleep yet, it's 721. <laughs> we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, almost, that, almost there. Uh, we just grew. I mean, look, this is where the, this is, this is us right here. Like just 2010, this, we're right here, we're right there. And that's us over there in 1930, or 1950. This is 1950. This is 1935, and it's just a little tiny. Can't see through me, can you? <laughs> It's just a little tiny portion of what's here. This is like 2010. I mean, so we grew. We, I always say the reason it's so warm is because this is an LCD display and it's getting off some heat. Uh, but the reason it's so warm is because we've roofed and paved over everything. And if it does rain, where's the water gonna go? It can't like soak in anymore because it's just because we love it here. I mean, it's so awesome to live here, right? Um, so we, we just have to figure it out. Look, there's California Circle right there. And here it is over here. You can see this, so that picture is only like this piece right here, but we're, we're, we're moving and grooving. We're, we're gonna be connecting with Los Gatos pretty soon. So, and that's just par for the course. So I, as I got older, <coughs> I started to think, so about this presentation, what do we need to do? Kristen, Don Alley, oh, Coastal Water, Greg Pepping, his group. I mean, I wish they were around when I was president at the Fly Fishing Club. Those guys are so fantastic. They're young. They're <laughs> our tomorrow. And so you. <laughs> and, and so I was thinking, what do we need? So the conservation is good. The habitat restoration is going really well. People are being more responsible about riparian corridors. So what do we need? What do we need? Hello. Not the insurance lady. This was better on my other one. It actually, you know. <laughs> but um, so flow. And I, I was driving home. I like to listen to NPR occasionally. 
And I, I heard this thing, it was like, it was, it was the light bulb that went off in my head. Somebody said, the average Californian uses 58 gallons of water a day. So each one of us uses 58 gallons of water a day. If you took three 55 gallon drums and you dumped them on the ground all at once, that's six cubic feet per second. That's what the fish get to live in in the summer. <coughs> So I, I heard the 58 gallons. I was like, ah, okay, I got the number now. I know what to do. So I took what's in Loch Lomond. And I just said, what if Loch Lomond was just a glass of water? Now I know that Loch Lomond didn't exist around here, but all the water was still there. It was flowing in abundance everywhere in all our creeks and rivers. And in 1850, there were only 643 people here. In 1961, Saul's tannery started or 1861. I, half the people probably worked at Saul's. Yeah. Um, if you were to look at Loch Lomond, or the, that capacity of water, 2.8 billion gallons of water that was in Loch Lomond, if it's 100% full, that water would have lasted 207 years. In 1920, look, at it, it's, it's still five years but look at today. It's 127 days. That's how much water, like if you just took Loch Lomond and you emptied it. We all use the water. 127 <laughs> days. So that's why there's this monster uh, issue about water. And if we want steelhead and salmon, maybe even some Chinook if they can get back someday. I didn't even talk about Chinook. We want the lamprey and the goby and the turtles and we want all that to survive. They need water. They need cubic feet per second. And to grow and thrive. Thrive, not just survive. The best period of growth seems to be April through June. Makes sense. Mayflies are hatching, the caddis are hatching, all the bugs are hatching in the river. It's got that nice winter flow that's calming down. Everything's coming alive. So the best period for growth of the fish is April through June. Well, we know the most critical period for survival, I mean, not even thriving, just to survive, is July through September. And that's because we have the most use of water. So we just need to figure this out. I mean, there's the diversion dam at felt, and that's not gonna go away. And at Tate Street, that's not gonna go away. Water rights, property owners pulling water, pot grapes. I, if somebody has a vineyard, okay. If, you have, if you're growing pot, you should have brought some. It's 420. <laughs> uh, but I mean, you know, it's potentially illegal. I don't want to be, I just want, I know this is the issue. So how do we get fish? Something more along the lines of 20 or 30. Would we be okay? I don't know, for summertime, that's a complex question. Maybe 50, um, but not six or eight. I actually, before I did this, I thought we were more like 25, but then, then Don Alley said, no, it gets really, really low in the summertime. And that's when the water heats up, the fish can't breathe, there's no food. So we just, we all need to be aware of that. You guys can be the next keepers of the stream. You know, in my business, I do electronics recycling, and everybody, green, 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 green. I'm like, <laughs> but I'm like, I'm sick of the green thing. I always say blue is the new green, because in my business, if the water is dirty and the air is dirty, it doesn't matter. We can't live. So we have to have blue sky and clear blue water. So that's the first thing we got to do. And then we have to just manage the balance. We're not going to stop growing. It's not going to get any better or worse, hopefully. But we can be the caretakers. And the best way to do it is by fly fishing for steelhead and salmon in the San Lorenzo River. <laughs> Why? Because you're going to buy a license. You're going to be on the water. You're going to talk to people. You're going to care. And you're going to do all the things that we want to do. But, but you can't do it here. You have to do it when you're on the river. And then you go, I think I'm going to go... I'm gonna go check out that Greg Pepping guy because he's pretty cool at Coastal Watershed Council because they do these beer things on Thursdays <laughs> and then they like restore the river. I'm gonna call Joe and Juliana because 
and you, you get involved, maybe even like me, just as some nutcase who really cares, for some reason or another, I'm like, why? It's, you know, but I do. So um, I was gonna show this video at the end, but did everybody see this? Was everybody here in the beginning? No. I just, you know, <clears throat> yeah. That's what I look like. I go down there and people see me fishing. I, I covered up the North Face thing. I didn't realize that. I was like, yeah. if it was Patagonia, I probably would have kept it there. <laughs> but, um, I definitely would have kept it there. Uh, but, um, you know, I go down there and people go, are you, are you nuts? You're fly fishing? I go, yeah. But when I hooked that fish and there were a bunch of people standing on the on the Felton Bridge, they were yelling, I bet that's good, tastes good with some lemon and butter later on. And I go, no way, man, there's fish going back in the water. And they're like, what are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. And they would say, are you caught that on a fly? And like literally, I got the got the fish to the beach and the fly fell out of, the, out of its mouth. And I was like, oh my god, that's perfect. I didn't even have to try to take the fly out. And and so I let the fish go, and the people up there were like, are you kidding me? Yeah, we're, we're, it's, it's crazy, but it's, it's, and it's hard. And, and yes, it's like a fish of a thousand, 10,000 cash, you know. And uh, so this is a video that I started when, when he got here. I'm not gonna play the whole thing because it doesn't make sense. But it doesn't make sense to you. This is some I mean, river can't where- but look at a steelhead and we, we wonder went where it was in the ocean. We didn't see this when they came in. Okay. The great runs of fish that filled all these rivers. That was nature's conveyor belt to bring all the nutrients from the ocean a thousand miles inland, deep in the mountains. Of Should I let this go? It's 11 minutes. Or when we can do questions and answers afterward. I really like or going to just beautiful places go. and having time to hang out we'll with my friends. It's quite good. I've already watched it like five times, so. You could have the sound down and take questions while we watch it. Kind of okay, but part of the, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll just, I'll leave this sound down, but I'll summarize by saying there's a guy in the beard, and he demonstrates how very difficult it is. And when they're, because he's, he's complaining the whole time, and they're here for five days fishing, and he, he's just complaining. He, he tied a bunch of flies. He's an Orvis guy, so he's like, I got for all these flies. I bought these new flies. We're probably going to sell them in the store, and I'm going to try all these flies. And the, the, the girl, they're all complaining. You know, the, the, it'll beat because they're cussing and swearing. Like, this is it's terrible. They don't want to be there because um, they aren't catching anything. So, uh, but it, it's, it's beautiful. Um, I brought some show and tell stuff, and what I was saying is, this is, this is my tiny little trout rod, although I caught an eight pound catfish with this rod. And it's a nice little noodly soft rod. I love to take to the Sierras with me. They're not normally all tangled up like this, although they do get that way. Um, and this is my, this is like an average steelhead rod. When we talk about numbers, so this is what we call a three weight, and it's matched with the reel and the line, because all, it, everything has to match. Your clothing, your boots, <laughs> the fly rod, it has colors, got to be yellows and greens. This is what we call an eight weight, so the bigger the number, the bigger the rod. And this is a nine foot eight weight rod, and it's a, it's a good stout rod for bass and steelhead on the San Lorenzo. They're using 13 foot spay rods. So on this rod, on the San Lorenzo, you're just flicking and chucking, but on this, the spay rod, it's beautiful. They do this big S cast. And it just makes a big like figure eight and the line just rolls and it's just a beauty. It's like knitting. You know, if, if you like knitting and things like that. Um, what river are they on? Uh, some undisclosed, top secret, Patagonia. It's undisclosed, but it's untouched. No dams, never been touched. No, 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 uh, no. They no. said the name of the lodge, so you could look up the name of the lodge. You would do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It says it's the you, you could probably look it up and it'd go more. It's just Dam a beautiful. Dam River Lodge. It, it's, uh, it's beautiful. 
she gets really frustrated because she's not catching anything. But her reels, their reels are like that big around. So they, you will get tired at the end of the day. Dan Bichette's? Dan Bichette's River Lodge, yeah, okay. You have to spend a lot of money there. <laughs> uh, uh, Joe said that when I, when I started fly fishing in 1991, um, I, I got in with abandon, and uh, I wanted to write articles. And so I wrote the Fly Rod and Reel, and I wrote the Fly Fisherman magazine. And the guys at Fly Fisherman magazine were like, "Well, thank you very much for your inquiry. I would like to explain to you the demographics and the type of people that read our magazine. I think they said publication, <laughs> not to be confusing a bobber with a strike indicator." 99% were like doctors, lawyers, uh, surgeons, uh, CEOs, CO, CF, CT, you know. And I was like, cool. Oh, comfort. But if, if you could spend a lot of money, or not, you can, you can do all this on a great budget. Mona bought me my vest when I was 30. I'm going to be 55 on Saturday. <laughs> Still there, man. <laughs> And your flies, if you're careful. Yeah. How long does a fly last? Uh, it can last like three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> or years. Like one cat, oh, bam! You know, or a bumping on the bottom. With steelhead fishing, oftentimes they're, they're fishing a wet line, so they're fishing a fly that's under the water and swimming through the water. That's what most of the flies are here. Most of the steelhead fishing is that way. And the fly is going to swing and be very close to the bottom where the fish are. And they always say, if you're not losing flies, you're not close enough to the bottom. Yeah. So they're big, heavy flies. When we call it the chuck and duck, we're not kidding. Because... <laughs> when it's just tungsten. So when it when if that hits you in the head and there's nothing here. You know. So <laughs> I was gonna say always. Always. I mean, you know you don't want one in the neck. Um, yeah, you should. As a matter of practice, polarized sunglasses, really great because you could see in the water. And if you have never worn polarized glasses or you've been wearing them all your life but you never paid attention because you never fly fished and you never went oh my god I can totally see the water because you never cared before but now now when you're fly fishing you're gonna be on the oh my god look at that and you're gonna pick up a rock and you're gonna find this little bug on the bottom of the rock and you're gonna peel that bug off and go it's a mayfly and you know you're gonna be looking for a mayfly to use when you're trout fishing wow not so much steel this guy's super depressed right now. It's like day five, he hasn't caught anything. Um, so yeah, gear, you know, Ernie's was a great place. Uh, 41st Avenue Angler was around. Um, outdoor World, I think you can still get some pretty good gear at Outdoor World. But, you know, with all the big box stores, the new Bass Pro Shops in San Jose, <laughs> you know, it's great. They have a bar, IPA, bowling, and everything you need. No way. Yes, wait. <laughs> you can get dinner there. You can get breakfast. Um, um, I have a question. Yes. So you mentioned that logging and um, the granite mines were kind of an impact. Um, gravel and sand. Yeah, gravel and sand, the sediment, right? Yeah. What, what do you think is impacting the rivers now in terms of, is that a loaded question? Well, uh, or? No, that's good because I think we are always going to have certain issues. <laughs> we, we, the San Lorenzo uh, River Symposium was a month or so ago. And Kristen, I have to say, I mean, your, your presentation, you should get it. Nice. Just call the county resources, get it, and look at it, because it's not 400 different pictures like mine is. Um, it's, like, it's on the mark. We're always going to have issues with woody debris, not enough woody debris, um, pollution, uh, diversion. Oh, they're always going to be there. We just have to manage it. But if we got water, if we can get the fish the water, they will, they will have a better chance. If, if, if Zianti has an accident and it's only 6 CFS, 
it's really going to kill the fish. I don't want my but if it's 20, so they can hide. Maybe get out of it. If it's 20 and there's not enough wood in the water, it's still it's there. And um, okay, you have to watch this because I think. I don't know. I don't fucking like stealing fish. <laughs> it's really frustrating. And boring. I think that's, that's the orcas guy, isn't it? It is. He's like we complained for five days. <laughs> yeah. Typical work feels good. It feels solid. It's like, it's like, yeah. And uh, it raises your spirits. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you do that, they're not pushing. My wife had to sit through. Oh my God! Hours after I caught that fish. Because their constituents aren't screaming and yelling at them to do it. We are the problem. The science on uh, it, those are fish waiting yeah, to go up in the river. The clock black. is ticking. All that black is those are fish. Really thousands and thousands for people. Yeah. Especially I've actually those seen those that in Alaska. Hunters, and we really care about the natural I flew over world. Over. To vote for politicians that are interested in making the kind of change that's required. That, uh, to me, that was the best part of the whole thing was him complaining. Stand up for Stephen. This. Tell Congress to act on the public. Sign the petition at coldwaters.org. This is not an advertisement. This is it. I just, you know. I, I was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay. Great. So. Uh, anyhow, this, I'm. Excited because it's my dry run. I, I, I literally didn't sleep and eat. Uh, Joe, I'm so happy. Thank you. I, the library, great. it's great. It's Kristen, for your help. Don, Don is a fantastic guy. He'll break your heart because he's really, really passionate. And everybody else, I mean, the Sanford Fly Fishermen, I would not be here without them. And I'm, I'm just super thrilled about the Coastal Watershed folks because they're, they're, they're on the mark. And um, like I said, they're all young. And that's what we need because, you know, yes. I have two questions. Um, what is that Thursday night and who puts that on again? Is it actually stream restoration that happens here? Oh, oh, well, I would say go to coastalwatershedcouncil.org and just subscribe. If you do Facebook, like their page, and they have very regular things. I said the Thursday night <coughs> this Thursday night tap room and we did it in concert with the Santa Cruz fly fishermen. Like I said, I wish we would have done that when I was president. Of course, I'd probably be a drunk by then. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but they're yeah. the people that are putting hands on the yes, stream. Yes, yeah. Great, great people. Um, My last second question was on the picture that you showed, uh, the old picture of the San Lorenzo at, um, in the flat area before the uh, Levy was put in. Yes. He had uh, the oceans down by the oceans. Down by the ocean yeah. mouth. He had fly fishermen on one side. Yes. Bait on the other. Yes. And people in the pram. Since steelhead weren't, since steelhead don't really eat much on the way up, and they're just trying to aggravate them. What are the bait people? Do you, what do you think they were using? Oh, the night crawlers. It's it's deadly. Yeah, they will eat. Yeah, they will. If you put it in front of, them, they smell protein. They're like, I'm on it. We're, we're I just they'll get something to go. With a fly, you're always just really just pissing them off because they can't smell anything, taste anything. And um, uh, some of the flies, you can get them to look like a worm or get them to look like a black leech or an egg pattern. I mean, uh, that's what we call them, like the egg sucking leech. Uh, you know, so you can get some. And then, you know, I have, well, you can see it all right here. You know, this is a chartreuse pattern with a very sharp hook. It's got the the red or the pink, so it looks like a salmon egg and it's flashy. When it's in the water and it's moving at 100 feet per second, you know, the fish are like, what was that? Okay, and then they're like, oh crap, that wasn't anything I wanted to eat. I always tell people, it's so small. They, people say, it's so small, how does the trout see it? Right, how does the fish see it? But I would say, if I was chucking M&Ms to you, and you were catching M&Ms, and you were really good at catching M&Ms, and I all of a sudden threw a fake one in, you'd know in a heartbeat and you go, which is exactly what the fish do. They spit it out immediately because they're like, oh, that wasn't real. You know, so you're trying to get them to 
you're really trying to get them to look hard at that really quick and grab it and then yeah before they go and pinching barbs is really good because they always come out of you easier too. <laughs> Serious. Give them the neck, your ear. Yeah. So. I had one in my face once. It was actually a daredevil lure with the barb hooks. And I was very low priority in the emergency room, so I got to sit there for a long time. <laughs> with an earring? I was, most, I was most worried about how I looked. <laughs> there, we, we used to have a... I did get the lure back. <laughs> but did you cut the hook? Yeah, it's too, it yeah. went from a try to two. Yes, yeah, you, have, you can't back it out. You can't. Yeah. You have to cut it off. Mm -hmm. uh, any, anyhow, gear is good. You, Cabela is... It's really not that expensive. Don't let it scare you. You can, you, and the Santa Cruz Fly Fisherman every first Wednesday, just go on the Santa Cruz Fly Fisherman's website, like them on Facebook. I mean, none of this existed when I did this, so it's like so easy. I mean, I, I wasted hours till I was like, I gotta go to sleep watching YouTube videos, because like, this is awesome. So, um, I will teach you how to cast. There's my name, phone number. I, I will talk to you till you run away. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.